Hi, my question's for Walter. Just have you, what you said about the um, suburbs being 7% cooler, have you published that? So the... What you said at the start about the leafy suburbs being 7% cooler. Oh, okay, yeah, the leafy suburbs being cooler, yes, there's been lots of work published. The um, National Centre for Environment and Population Health at Australian National University, John Curtin School of Medical Research, <laughs> yes, they've published that, right? There's also some work in uh, California, Greg McPherson's group, and uh, Roland Levos's group in Manchester in the UK that have done similar sort of things with climate and urban trees and so on. Yeah, and agriculture, we've got uh, other sort of examples. For example, in Kalimantan, in Borneo, uh, yeah, we get 15 degrees centigrade difference between, of course, the original rainforest, you know, within the rainforest canopy compared to the uh, palm oil, sort of exposed, desiccated plantations outside that used to be rainforest. And the Monash Group has also published that data. It's OK. okay. The Monash Group, um, Nicholson and, and the rest of them out there have published the data for Melbourne. It's about eight degrees. More questions? Up the back. Uh, just in terms of... Um, Soil volumes required to support tree canopy in terms of e urban tree planting. Um, I know Urban has published a, a small amount of data on that, but uh, is there much work around on that that can guide the soil volumes required? Yeah, yeah, there is um, quite a bit of work. If you, I mean, James Urban has published a a diagram that or, or a model that basically asks you to evaluate the, the crown projection area, so the, the radius if you, or the diameter of the crown projected on, onto the ground, and use that then to, there's a multiplier up, uh, to work out how much volume you should be using for a, a mature tree. So you have to make an estimation of the potential crown uh, projection. So if you, obviously if you've got a, an oak tree, um, that might be you know, quite, quite extensive. And then from that value, you can then assess the, the volume that's required. I have to say, though, the methodology is, you know, I mean, it, it's fair enough. I understand why they've gone um, down the road they have, but there are lots of variables that will also influence how much volume a, so a tree needs. So it's, it's based on, on Nina Bassick's work in the early 90s, I think, what James Urban has published, and it's about 0 0.6 cubic meters per uh, meter of uh, crown projection. But there's, I mean, plenty of work to suggest that even small trees, there's some data um, that says that a three-year-old prunus tree occupied 50 cubic meters of soil. So, you know, these formulas are all very well, and they're helpful, they're tools, but uh, actually working out how much volume a tree needs in terms of its soil is quite complex. Look, uh, thank you very much. Actually, it's interesting. I, I come from a forestry background. And of course, in forestry, we have spacing trials, right? And if you go to a rainforest, for example, you've got literally, you know, like a thousand trees per hectare, all competing, all surviving, all healthy. So you say, hang on a minute, they each haven't got that much volume because how would you get a thousand trees per hectare? And so you've got another whole dimension in this which you can exploit as well very successfully. You see, it's not just the volume, but it's also the efficiency of cycling, okay? And so we've got rainforests that are surviving on very, very poor soils, often very shallow, Fraser Island, even sands, you know, crushed glass with basically no nutrients. And you've got rainforests, the most terrestrially, the most bioproductive system on this planet. And of course, how is that possible? Because these trees, the fungi driving these trees, are cycling a limited pool of nutrients so efficiently that that's sustaining that tree. And of course, you can do that in urban habitats, right? So this is a case of if I can keep those cycles going, I can support a tree even on a smaller you know, footprint. And of course, this comes to what Matt was saying, hey, you don't want to rake up the leaves and burn them, you just want to make sure that those worms, those fungis, are cycling them pronto. Uh, I'm on for Dr. Moore. 
Tree roots and tree guards. Um, you got me worried now. Tree guards or tree barriers? Ah, oh, sorry, tree barri root well, barriers. Tree root barriers. How deep should you go if you don't use a copper based? Well, again, it's very variable. It depends on the sort of soil you've got and the conditions of the soil. So roots will grow down and contrary to a popular belief, they'll grow up just as easily on the other side of a barrier. So if you don't fill properly around the barrier, you can go down two or three metres and the roots will simply go down underneath and come up. If you properly compact, and the figure that was given before of about 1.4, it's a pretty good guide, then they can be quite effective. The, the real problem with tree guards is not, the, not conceptually and, and not technological. We actually have the technology. It's actually whether they're installed properly. And they very rarely are. And the other question that you have to ask yourself is why are you installing a, a barrier? Um, in many situations, the barrier is done not for anything to do with the tree or even damage that's being done. It's about risk mitigation, um, some, something being seen to be done. So I think if you do it for the right reasons and you do it properly, I have no doubt that barriers can work. But I think you should be worried because I can't recall seeing a barrier installed properly, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I've seen a whole lot of them. Now, I know people do it, yep, and I know people can. I'm just saying I haven't seen one. Um, but I've said all along, and I make it quite clear, barriers can be effective. They have to be installed properly, and a small number of people do it properly. Um, copper is a fungicide and copper has a really long residual in the soil so you've got to be really careful when you're throwing these things around because yes you might be uh, trying to stop root activity but you're also killing off microbial interaction as well uh, and then copper having such a long residual in the soil it's it can take it so much it make, make, it make the job of trying to replace that biology so much harder. Question from up the back. Uh, this is just one of the panel. Um, if you're actually doing what Greg was discussing a little bit earlier with, um, I suppose, air spading or doing demonstrating that you're looking at roots and where they go, how much are you affecting the mycorrhizae, et cetera, underneath in displacing all of that? A lot. Um, a lot. And, and no one pretends otherwise. Um, I must admit, before I got access to the, the trees at the weight, we had a, a lengthy discussion about whether those trees were capable of taking the shock, and in particular the maculata, because I don't know whether people realise it, but we've excavated it twice um, over a period of about 15 years. So I'm not a great fan of blowing the hell out of anything, to be honest, with an air spade, um, but you are uh, certainly not only interfering with the mycorrhizal fungi, um, but you can also do uh, root tip damage, uh, which can also sort of muck up your root system so it has to be understood. Uh, just, just as a matter of interest and, and to complement what the others said, um, I've seen a spectacular example personally where an oak uh, was, uh, had a uh, paving material laid all across the oak and, and its response was within four weeks to shed every leaf that it had. Now in fact the oak was the feature of this particular site. It's in another state, I might mention. And um, the panic set in and the, uh, the solution to that was mulch with uh, worms. Um, and within eight weeks, that tree was back in leaf, right time of the year, obviously. So I'm a great believer in uh, mulch. And uh, just to pinch a, a comment from one of my colleagues, Peter May, um, he was at the Landscape Below Ground meeting. And they had, uh, I think he said 20 of the world's leading urban soil scientists sitting around the table. And they were asked, what was the single greatest sort of development in urban soil science in the previous two decades? And the answer was mulch <laughs> from all of them. It says a lot. I'll just uh, chip in here. I mean, you know, if you read the Airspade website or whatever, they're often pretty, uh, one of the claims they make is it doesn't do any root damage. And anyone that's used, used an Airspade or a similar tool will recognize that that can't possibly be the case. I think... Uh, the reason it's a useful intervention is what you end up with is just so, so much more radically different and, and, and much, much better for fine root development than what you start with. So if, you, if you've got evidence to s suggest that it's compacted uh, above these thresholds that we know are root limiting, that it's not, not been mulched, 
the, the damage that you do in the short term uh, is you know, compensated for for long-term ability of the root system to recover. You've got to remember that the turnover of fine roots in trees can often be a matter of days or, or weeks. And, and actually, damaging some fine roots in the short term that may only have been in existence for a couple of weeks uh, in order to you know, create a whole rooting volume that's now accessible to fine root growth is much, much better than non-intervention and, and leaving it to uh, you know, just go on as it is. Uh, if you can't, if you can't uh, do the airspace stuff, just mulching does work, absolutely works. Um, often the, the transition from poor quality to a much better quality rooting environment is longer, but it absolutely is better than doing nothing. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Andy. The, th the thing is, is oh, sorry, um, oxygen is essential for all of the living organisms that we're talking about. So if you've got high compaction and you've got low oxygen and you've got nutrients that are becoming toxic and you don't have soil biology, then you need to do something to get the oxygen in there. And if that's a physical treatment, whether it be coring or trenching or the air spade, it needs to be done. But what happens microbially is you, you might not necessarily get all your mycorrhiza back straight away. More than likely they're going to die, they're gonna, especially with an air spade blowing them off the, the, uh, the cortical cell wall, that's not going to be good for the mycorrhiza. What will happen is, is it'll, it'll go back how nature works, it'll go back to a bacterial system. So you turn the soil over, you aerate it, you'll get a big flush and bloom of bacterial growth and then you'll get protozoa that are predating on that bacteria and then you the system starts to work and then fungi grow out the other end. Fungi need time to establish. They don't, it doesn't happen straight away. And if you're trying to put you know, things like mycorrhiza into an environment where you've got such high levels of compaction, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get them to colonize. Um, the thing about mycorrhiza as well is that all these inoculums that are available, they are useless unless you can get them directly to the cortical cell wall. So unless you know where the roots are, and quite often you don't, and it's very difficult in a compacted soil to, to get these type of products there, uh, it's better to embrace the natural microbial action and start with all your other microbial groups first, establish those, and then um, bring in the mycorrhiza. It's not just about mycorrhiza, it's about all of the microbial groups. Yeah. Can I also sort of add that, look, the whole structure of soils and the aggregation of soils is governed by these fungal hyphae, you know, sort of t bringing all these soil particles together, forming aggregates, forming micro channels where then water and oxygen penetrates. So in a sense, blasting all that up and then saying, yes, I can artificially mix things and then I can reconstruct something for a while. Yeah, it might be there, but very quickly it'll collapse again. So often you may avoid, you can avoid a lot of that thing. And as we said, look, all we need to do is how do we encourage worms back in there so they can actually start putting those worm canals down deeper into the soil, aerating the soils, or even better still, how do I get you know pioneer plants that operate as, in a sense, jackhammers with deep root canals, penetrating to deeper layers, oxygenating deeper layers. So often you can say, yeah, I can just put a cover plant crop, I mean, a cover plant cropping of, you know, these deep root penetrating plants into that site and, in a sense, aerate the soil that way. So there's a lot, lot more uh, simpler ecological ways than, you know, like us intervening physically always. Um, guys, perhaps you've partly answered my question, and that was um, the association between uh, beneficial fungi and descending roots. What specifically did you want to know? Because there's certainly a relationship, but the, the problem with descending roots is that they're normally relatively short-lived unless they tap into uh, good conditions, and then all of the things that have been spoken here. If you haven't got the right aeration, bulk density, moisture, uh, nutrients, then you don't get those mycorrhizal associations. Um, with descending roots, they tend to grow downwards. Um, the Americans call them vertical group, uh, roots and the foresters call them sinkers. Um, but as they grow down, they, they normally end up sort of being self-limiting, a bit like the taproot was originally in most circumstances, then they die back and then they re-establish. But for the most part, there is an association. 
Um, it's just not um, in compared to the, the mass of the root plate roots, it's a relatively minor mass. So if that was your question, relatively minor but still important. Oops. Yeah, look, uh, just on, on that one, it depends on horses for courses, but for example in Jarrah, Mulga, places like that, you've got these lateral sinker roots in natural vegetations going down to 50 metres. And these lateral sinkers will go down to another soil stratum where it's either getting moisture or it's getting actual nutrients and then will proliferate with fibrous roots at 50 metres depth to take those you know, essential nutrients up. At that level, it will form different specific symbiotic fungal relationships, but they've got no bearing to those that are existing in the organic matter at the surface. You know, so there's, I mean, it's almost like a, uh, yeah, it's a symbiosis of different organisms in different sites, and a tree may have 20, 30 different symbionts to exploit different habitats, including at 50 metres depth. Andy, um, you showed a, um, a short video of a um, root growth growing through soil, uh, loose soil and dense soil. And um, um, apropos to what we were just talking about, uh, we as engineers have, have found uh, a number of vertical roots growing in uh, highly expansive soil in a dry climate because those highly expansive soils are high cracking soils and so the roots find their way through those cracks and some of them are continuous and uh, so as a result uh, we the tree root systems that we're finding is less horizontal spread of roots and more a vertical spread of root. And that affects um, the amount of ground movement and that affects foundation movement. Yeah, I mean, was, was there a question or did you want... No, I, I just wanted to bring in uh, some observations that uh, Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say make. that, yeah, so fracturing soil, I mean, roots will exploit uh, a whole range of soil environments and they certainly will grow through cracks in the soil and, and then can get very deep down. I mean the deepest we are aware of was a Boswellia tree, uh, no sorry, Bushia tree in the Kalahari Desert was found at 68 metres down, which is the deepest. And, and you know sinker roots and so on certainly uh, 20 to 50 metres in, in a lot of these dry land environments is, is perfectly possible. Often that's in deep sandy soils which tend to have lower uh, soil strength uh, so roots are able to grow and, and often that can be through cracks in rocks and, and anyone that's observed uh, cliff top trees often you see roots right down at the base of those that, that, that must have come through cracks because the rock is you know there's no way it's growing through that so th the thing is it's highly highly variable soil conditions and then you have interactions with species and so on. so it doesn't surprise me under a certain set of circumstances where you have species that are capable of deep rooting with the soil conditions that almost enforce deep rooting through cracks and so on that you're, you're seeing that um, and the other thing that we haven't discussed but it would be very important at an ecological level is the ability of roots to um, hydraulically redistribute water within the soil from deep deep uh, soil uh, pools, bring that water up that can enable other vegetation to grow that wouldn't have otherwise been, and they can act as uh, really shift a lot of water around just following the root water potential gradients that exist. So, I mean, it, all of this is just kind of really scratching the surface. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of literature on root depth. Um, I was searching through the literature late last year on this issue. Um, I personally have certainly seen roots come down through cracks and fissures uh, in excess of 50 metres, uh, mainly in limestone, but I've, because you can see it fairly easily through the caves and things. You can actually identify some of those to the species growing above. So while we talk about a, a shallow spreading root system, um, I think the basic rules come first, and that is that roots are opportunistic. And the cracks, if they follow a crack, and that crack provides the right oxygen, moisture and nutrients, they'll be there forever. 
Similarly with um, tap roots, if you've got a young seedling and it latches onto, the tap root latches onto uh, an appropriate water course or drainage system, it can be there for the life of the tree and I've seen them absolutely massive. Uh, the biggest one that I've seen in diameter was just under half a metre for a single root. It was absolutely massive. But also um, the descending roots are highly opportunistic and so if they do get into a crack running to a depth and you keep the moisture up and you keep the air then they can become quite significant and they can become permanent. Uh, and the biggest one of those I've seen was 400 millimetres in diameter. Now most of them are about a quarter of that size or less. The interesting thing is that in most soils, when you get down beyond a couple of metres, not all, but in most soils, then you don't get the roots. They might be very fine, but that you won't get major structural roots. You may get absorbing roots. And as was said before, they, they're quite ephemeral. They come and go. I think that people often forget that root systems, I, I consider you know, fine absorbing roots a bit like uh, below ground leaves. Uh, they're regularly shed and regularly recycled. Yes. Yes. They'll, 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 a structural root can certainly get to that size. Uh, I've seen something similar with elms, uh, and I've also seen it with eucalypts, where they may be tapping into stuff a long way away, and they're doing that uh, hydraulic redistribution, um, you know, <laughs> horizontally. So they can be absolutely massive, absolutely massive, and they can certainly do damage to lesser structures. No question about that. Uh, they shouldn't be moving uh, a house foundation if it's properly constructed because they can't put the pressure sideways. They, 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 they'll exert pressure and quite considerable pressure, but it shouldn't be enough. My question is for Matt. Um, what would stop a tree producing the root exudates that you're talking about that allow it to communicate with the mycorrhizae and the nematodes? I, I don't know how you would stop it. It's a natural process. Right. Well, if there's not enough water, then uh, exudates can be reduced because they have to prioritise and perhaps other, other uses for that water. But, but under normal circumstances... And, and everything will slow too. You, your microbial... Um, interactions will slow as well in a drought situation. But w why would you want to stop it? No, no, I'm just wondering what the triggers are. Oh, right, sorry, I, th I thought you yeah. asked. Look, uh, we've got it around the wrong way, you see. It's not when would a tree stop its exudates. Look, that tree depends fundamentally on the nutrients it's getting from these fungi, right? So the tree, the green scum on the surface, the tree is only really there to feed the fungi. The feedy fungi are running the show, right? And so basically, you know, we, we've really got this in terms of photomicrographs and radio label tracers. So basically, no, the exudates go to those roots that are providing the nutrients to that tree. And a tree will shut off, basically, exudates to 80% of its root network to feed those areas that are supplying it with nutrients. So it's the fungi that control, you know, where the exudates go. And the fungi are just milking the tree for exudates. Okay, the tree, I mean, why does it want to waste, you know, 40% of its photosynthate on these fungi? Well, sorry, it won't survive without it. Okay, I've got a question up the back. Um, just inquiring about, everybody knows about improving soils is gonna improve tree health in general. How do you see this applying in everyday use within councils where we're planting trees into hard infrastructure into a 1.5 by 1.5 tree square? How can you, you see any way of improving soil in that scenario? Yeah, look, it's fundamental. I mean, I don't want to be rude or anything, but I see you're, you're still growing those trees effectively hydroponically. You know, we saw the thing, you know, uh, Andy was auctioning off trees six metres high with one metre sort of root bowls. And basically, yeah, it's hydroponics, isn't it? You just sort of got bigger pots in concrete. And the argument I'd sort of put is to say, hang on, if you're going to put thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of dollars into that landscape, you, you should think of, hang on, how do I get the viability and the 
you know, the probability that tree survives, 90% plus probability. And that really becomes a performance measure, not the 25%. And to do that, you might say, do I start with a much, much smaller tree? And do I create the right ecological soil environment in that space to allow that root system and that tree to have that chance? But starting off, you know, with a big tree, more or less in a hydroponic hole, it's disaster. Uh, we, we've put $75 million into an arboretum at Canberra. You know, this is the National Arboretum, so all you guys are paying. And the point is that, you know, they've had Wallamai pines, and they've put thousands of Wallamai pines at, what, $500 a piece, and they've all just died because they just put them into a hole dug in the clay, you know, which desiccates when it's drought, which floods when it's uh, wet, and obviously they just die, you know because we've got to create the right habitat and then grow them as nature does from seedlings, little ones. Yeah, yeah. And start smaller, you know, $2 a tree, but giving them that chance in that habitat. The, the nursery industry is uh, quite fearful for disease. You, you can understand they've, they put a lot of investment into growing their trees, so they use sterile, you know, they sterilise their mediums. So you're putting, you're planting trees with, that have grown from sterilised mediums without the microbial groups or function or balance in, into an environment um, that's hostile again. You know, you, the, 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 the microbial groups. All the testing that we do, we've, we don't find really healthy suburbs, uh, healthy soils in any of the suburbs. There, there's issues everywhere. Um, and there's plenty of things we can do. There's, we just need to, you know, I think we need to rethink it and, 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 and do it well, invest that, well. Like once you start fertilising those trees to keep them growing, you know, even from seedlings, you've killed all those fungi, you know, because basically these fungi respond to excess nutrients by dying. And so you're really in a hydroponic pot. Yeah. One, of the, uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd just add there, I think what's been said is right. The, uh, the nursery industry has got a lot of data. So, for example, way back in the early 80s, uh, we knew that we could put, put out a nice young eucalypt seedling in 12 weeks. Um, but it, it, in bigger pots and, and doing things slightly differently. Um, but the nursery business is essentially about space, really, in lots of ways, uh, particularly the retail business. So smaller pots keep them a bit longer and so on. And so you, you sort of create this recipe. But certainly I think as arborists, um, there, you, what, you, what you've asked is a management question in a political context. <laughs> and uh, the politics is going to win out, isn't it? But everyone in this room knows that if we provided smaller street trees in, that were better looked after and better managed, everyone would be better off. Now I think we're moving towards that um, circumstance uh, and I also think we're going to eventually have to confront the, the issues of confinement of root space, you know, common cha channels uh, for uh, utilities and so on. Uh, everyone wants it and no one's bitten the bullet. So I think, I think your question in some ways was a Dorothy Dixie. You probably know the answer better than we do. And um, it's one of those things that we, everybody knows what the answer is, but the politics and the economics are working against us. Okay, we might leave it there. Thank you, gentlemen.